the Demon Pope by Richard Garnett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. The Demon Pope by Richard Garnett. So you won't sell me your soul?" said the devil. Thank you, replied the student. I had rather keep it myself, if it's all the same to you. But it is not all the same to me. I want it very particularly. Come, I'll be liberal. I said twenty years. You can have thirty. The student shook his head. Forty. Another shake. Fifty. As before. Now, said the devil, I know I'm going to do a foolish thing, but I cannot bear to see a clever-spirited young man throw himself away. I'll make you another kind of offer. We don't have any bargain at present, but I will push you on in the world for the next forty years. This day, forty years, I come back and ask you for a boon. Not your soul, mind, or anything not perfectly in your power to grant. If you give it, we are quits. If not, I fly away with you. What do you say to this?" The student reflected for some minutes. Agreed, he said at last. Scarcely had the devil disappeared, which he did instantaneously, ere a messenger reined in his smoking steed at the gate of the University of Cordova. The judicious reader will already have remarked that Lucifer could never have been allowed inside a Christian seat of learning and inquiring for the student gerbert presented him with the emperor otho's nomination to the abbacy of babio in consideration said the document of his virtue and learning well nigh miraculous in one so young such messengers were frequent visitors during gerbert's prosperous career abbot bishop archbishop cardinal he was ultimately enthroned pope on april second nine ninety nine and assumed the appellation of Sylvester the Second. It was then a general belief that the world would come to an end in the following year, a catastrophe which to many seemed the more imminent from the election of a chief pastor whose celebrity as a theologian, though not inconsiderable, by no means equaled his reputation as a necromancer. The world, notwithstanding, revolved scathelessly through the dreaded twelve-month and early in the first year of the eleventh century, Gerbert was sitting peacefully in his study, perusing a book of magic. Volumes of algebra, astrology, alchemy, Aristotelian philosophy, and other such light reading filled his bookcase. And on a table stood an improved clock of his invention, next to his introduction of the Arabic numerals, his chief legacy to posterity. Suddenly a sound of wings was heard, and Lucifer stood by his side. "'It is a long time,' said the fiend, "'since I have had the pleasure of seeing you. I have now called to remind you of our little contract concluded this day forty years.' "'You remember,' said Sylvester, "'that you are not to ask anything exceeding my power to perform.' "'I have no such intention,' said Lucifer. On the contrary, I am about to solicit a favor which can be bestowed by you alone. You are Pope. I desire that you would make me a cardinal." "'In the expectation, I presume,' returned Gerbert, "'of becoming Pope on the next vacancy.' "'An expectation,' replied Lucifer, "'which I may most reasonably entertain considering my enormous wealth and proficiency in intrigue, and the present condition of the sacred college.' You would doubtless, said Gerbert, endeavor to subvert the foundations of the faith, and by a course of profligacy and licentiousness render the Holy See odious and contemptible. On the contrary, said the fiend, I would extirpate heresy and all learning and knowledge as inevitably tending thereunto. I would suffer no man to read but the priest, and confine his reading to his breviary. I would burn your books together with your bones on the first convenient opportunity. 
I would observe an austere propriety of conduct, and be especially careful not to loosen one rivet in the tremendous yoke I was forging for the minds and consciences of mankind. If it be so, said Gerbert, let's be off. What? exclaimed Lucifer. You are willing to accompany me to the infernal regions? Assuredly, rather than be accessory to the burning of Plato and Aristotle, and give place to the darkness against which I have been contending all my life. Gerbert, replied the demon, this is arrant trifling. Know you not that no good man can enter my dominions? That were such a thing possible, my empire would become intolerable to me, and I should be compelled to abdicate. I do know it, said Gerbert and hence I have been able to receive your visit with composure. Gerbert, said the devil, with tears in his eyes, I put it to you, is this fair, is this honest? I undertake to promote your interests in the world. I fulfill my promise abundantly. You obtain through my instrumentality a position to which you could never otherwise have aspired. Often have I had a hand in the election of a pope, but never before have I contributed to confer the tiara on one eminent for virtue and learning. You profit by my assistance to the full, and now take advantage of an adventitious circumstance to deprive me of my reasonable guerdon. It is my constant experience that the good people are much more slippery than the sinners, and drive much harder bargains." "'Lucifer,' answered Gerbert. I have always sought to treat you as a gentleman, hoping that you would approve yourself such in return. I will not inquire whether it was entirely in harmony with this character to seek to intimidate me into compliance with your demand by threatening me with a penalty which you well knew could not be enforced. I will overlook this little irregularity and concede even more than you have requested. You have asked to be a cardinal. I will make you a pope. Ha! exclaimed Lucifer, and an internal glow suffused his sooty hide as the light of a fading ember is revived by breathing upon it. For twelve hours, continued Gerbert, at the expiration of that time we will consider the matter further, and if, as I anticipate, you are more anxious to divest yourself of the papal dignity than you were to assume it, I promise to bestow upon you any boon you may ask within my power to grant, and not plainly inconsistent with religion or morals." "'Done!' cried the demon. Gerbert uttered some cabalistic words, and in a moment the apartment held two Pope Sylvesters entirely indistinguishable save by their attire and the fact that one limped slightly with the left foot. "'You will find the pontifical apparel in this cupboard,' said Gerbert, and, taking his book of magic with him, he retreated through a masked door to a secret chamber. As the door closed behind him, he chuckled and muttered to himself, "'Poor old Lucifer! Sold again!' If Lucifer was sold, he did not seem to know it. He approached a large slab of silver which did duty as a mirror, and contemplated his personal appearance with some dissatisfaction. "'I certainly don't look half so well without my horns,' he soliloquized, "'and I am sure I shall miss my tail most grievously.' A tiara and train, however, made fair amends for the deficient appendages, and Lucifer now looked every inch a pope. He was about to call the master of ceremonies and summon a consistory, when the door was burst open and seven cardinals brandishing poniards rushed into the room. "'Down with the sorcerer!' they cried as they seized and gagged him. "'Death to Saracen! Practices algebra and other devilish arts. Knows Greek, talks Arabic, reads Hebrew. Burn him! Smother him! Let him be deposed by a general council," said a young and inexperienced cardinal. Heaven forbid," said an old and wary one, sotto voce. Lucifer struggled frantically, but the feeble frame he was doomed to inhabit for the next eleven hours was speedily exhausted. Bound and helpless, he swooned away. Brethren, said one of the senior cardinals, 
It hath been delivered by the exorcists that a sorcerer or other individual in league with the demon doth usually bear upon his person some visible token of his infernal compact. I propose that we forthwith institute a search for this stigma, the discovery of which may contribute to justify our proceedings in the eyes of the world. I heartily approve of our brother Anno's proposition, said another the rather as we cannot possibly fail to discover such a mark, if indeed we desire to find it. The search was accordingly instituted, and had not proceeded far ere a simultaneous yell from all the seven cardinals indicated that their investigation had brought more light than they had ventured to expect. The Holy Father had a cloven foot. For the next five minutes the cardinals remained utterly stunned, silent, and stupefied with amazement. As they gradually recovered their faculties, it would have become manifest to a nice observer that the Pope had risen very considerably in their good opinion. This is an affair requiring very mature deliberation, said one. I always feared that we might be proceeding too precipitately, said another. It is written, the devils believe, said a third. The Holy Father, therefore, is not a heretic at any rate. Brethren, said Anno, this affair, as our brother Bano well remarks, doth indeed call for mature deliberation. I therefore propose that, instead of smothering His Holiness with cushions as originally contemplated, we immure him for the present in the dungeon adjoining hereunto, and, after spending the night in meditation and prayer, resume the consideration of the business tomorrow morning. Informing the officials of the palace, said Baino, that His Holiness has retired for his devotions and desires on no account to be disturbed. A pious fraud, said Anno, which not one of the fathers would for a moment have scrupled to commit. The cardinals accordingly lifted the still insensible Lucifer and bore him carefully, almost tenderly, to the apartment appointed for his detention. Each would fain have lingered in hopes of his recovery, but each felt that the eyes of his six brethren were upon him, and all, therefore, retired simultaneously, each taking a key of the cell. Lucifer regained consciousness almost immediately afterwards. He had the most confused idea of the circumstances which had involved him in his present scrape, and could only say to himself that if they were the usual concomitants of the papal dignity, these were by no means to his taste, and he wished he had been made acquainted with them sooner. The dungeon was not only perfectly dark, but horribly cold, and the poor devil in his present form had no latent source of infernal heat to draw upon. His teeth chattered. He shivered in every limb, and felt devoured with a hunger and thirst. There is much probability in the assertion of some of his biographers that it was on this occasion that he invented ardent spirits. But even if he did, the mere conception of a glass of brandy could only increase his sufferings. So the long January night wore wearily on, and Lucifer seemed likely to expire from inanition when a key turned in the lock and Cardinal Anno cautiously glided in, bearing a lamp, a loaf, half a cold roast kid, and a bottle of wine. "'I trust,' he said, bowing courteously, "'that I may be excused any slight breach of etiquette of which I may render myself culpable from the difficulty under which I labor of determining whether, under present circumstances, your holiness or your infernal majesty, be the form of address most befitting me to employ. bub ub bub boo went Lucifer, who still had the gag in his mouth. Heavens! exclaimed the cardinal. I crave your infernal holiness's forgiveness. What a lamentable oversight! And relieving Lucifer from his gag and bonds, he set out the refection upon which the demon fell voraciously. Why the devil, if I may so express myself, pursued Anno, did not your holiness inform us that you were the devil? Not a hand would have been raised against you. I myself have been seeking all my life for the audience now happily vouchsafed me. Whence this mistrust of your faithful Anno, who has served you so loyally and zealously these many years? 
Lucifer pointed significantly to the gag and fetters. I shall never forgive myself, protested the cardinal, for the part I have borne in this unfortunate transaction. Next to ministering to your majesty's bodily necessities, there is nothing I have so much at heart as to express my penitence. But I entreat your majesty to remember that I believed myself to be acting in your majesty's interest by overthrowing a magician who was accustomed to send your majesty upon errands, and who might at any time enclose you in a box and cast you into the sea. It is deplorable that your majesty's most devoted servants should have been thus misled." Reasons of state, suggested Lucifer. I trust they no longer operate said the cardinal. However, the sacred college is now fully possessed of the whole matter. It is therefore unnecessary to pursue this department of the subject further. I would now humbly crave leave to confer with your majesty, or rather, perhaps your holiness, since I am about to speak of spiritual things, on the important and delicate point of your holiness's successor. I am ignorant how long Your Holiness proposes to occupy the apostolic chair, but, of course, you are aware that public opinion will not suffer you to hold it for a term exceeding that of the pontificate of Peter. A vacancy, therefore, must one day occur, and I am humbly to represent that the office could not be filled by one more congenial than myself to the present incumbent, or on whom he could more fully rely to carry out in every respect his views and intentions. And the cardinal proceeded to detail various circumstances of his past life, which certainly seemed to corroborate his assertion. He had not, however, proceeded far ere he was disturbed by the grating of another key in the lock, and had just time to whisper impressively, Beware of Baino, ere he dived under a table. Beno was also provided with a lamp, wine, and cold viands, warned by the other lamp and the remains of Lucifer's repast that some colleague had been beforehand with him, and not knowing how many more might be in the field, he came briefly to the point as regarded the papacy, and preferred his claim in much the same manner as Anno. While he was earnestly cautioning Lucifer against this cardinal as one who could and would cheat the very devil himself. Another key turned in the lock, and Baino escaped under the table, where Anno immediately inserted his fingers into his right eye. The little squeal consequent upon this occurrence Lucifer successfully smothered by a fit of coughing. Cardinal number three, a Frenchman, bore a Bayonne ham and exhibited the same disgust as Baino on seeing himself forestalled. So far as his requests transpired, they were moderate, but no one knows where he would have stopped if he had not been scared by the advent of Cardinal Number 4. Up to this time he had only asked for an inexhaustible purse, power to call up the devil ad libitum, and a ring of invisibility to allow him free access to his mistress, who was, unfortunately, a married woman. Cardinal number four chiefly wanted to be put into the way of poisoning Cardinal number five, and Cardinal number five preferred the same petition as respected Cardinal number four. Cardinal number six, an Englishman, demanded the reversion of the archbishoprics of Canterbury and York with the faculty of holding them together, and of unlimited non-residence. In the course of his harangue he made use of the phrase non obstantibus of which Lucifer immediately took notice. What the seventh cardinal would have solicited is not known, for he had hardly opened his mouth when the twelfth hour expired, and Lucifer, regaining his vigor with his shape, sent the prince of the church spinning to the other end of the room, and split the marble table with a single stroke of his tail. The six crouched and huddled cardinals cowered, revealed to one another, and at the same time enjoyed the spectacle of His Holiness darting through the stone ceiling, which yielded like a film to his passage, and closed up afterwards as if nothing had happened. After the first shock of dismay they unanimously rushed to the door, but found it bolted on the outside. There was no other exit, and no means of giving an alarm. In this emergency the demeanor of the Italian cardinals set a bright example to their ultramontane colleagues. Be sacna they said as they shrugged their shoulders. 
Nothing could exceed the mutual politeness of Cardinals Anno and Beno, unless that of the two who had sought to poison each other. The Frenchman was held to have gravely derogated from good manners by alluding to this circumstance, which had reached his ears while he was under the table. And the Englishman swore so outrageously at the plight in which he found himself that the Italians then and there silently registered a vow that none of his nation should ever be Pope, a maxim which, with one exception, has been observed to this day. Lucifer, meanwhile, had repaired to Sylvester, whom he found arrayed in all the insignia of his dignity, of which, as he remarked, he thought his visitor had probably had enough. I should think so, indeed, replied Lucifer. But, at the same time, I feel myself fully repaid for all I have undergone by the assurance of the loyalty of my friends and admirers, and the conviction that it is needless for me to devote any considerable amount of personal attention to ecclesiastical affairs. I now claim the promised boon which it will be in no way inconsistent with thy functions to grant, seeing that it is a work of mercy. I demand that the cardinals be released, and that their conspiracy against thee, by which I alone suffered, be buried in oblivion." "'I hoped you would carry them all off,' said Gerbert, with an expression of disappointment. "'Thank you,' said the devil. "'It is more to my interest to leave them where they are.' So the dungeon door was unbolted, and the cardinals came forth, sheepish and crestfallen. If, after all, they did less mischief than Lucifer had expected from them, the cause was their entire bewilderment by what had passed, and their utter inability to penetrate the policy of Gerbert, who henceforth devoted himself even with ostentation to good works. They could never quite satisfy themselves whether they were speaking to the Pope or to the Devil, and, when under the latter impression, habitually emitted propositions which Gerbert justly stigmatized as rash, temeritous, and scandalous. They plagued him with allusions to certain matters mentioned in their interviews with Lucifer, with which they naturally but erroneously supposed him to be conversant, and worried him by continual nods and titterings as they glanced at his nether extremities. To abolish this nuisance, and at the same time silence sundry unpleasant rumors which had somehow got abroad, Gerbert devised the ceremony of kissing the Pope's feet, which, in a grievously mutilated form, endures to this day. The stupefaction of the cardinals on discovering that the Holy Father had lost his hoof surpasses all description, and they went to their graves without having obtained the least insight into the mystery. End of The Demon Pope by Richard Garnett